Hi, Alan. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. We're in the doctor's opinion this week, and we're going to talk about a lot of facts that are kind of hard to follow, kind of slap you upside the head with some of these facts we're going to read. We're on page 28, Roman numeral 28. So it's XXVIII at the very bottom of the page, the last paragraph. And we start out with a bold statement that is a fact. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Anybody disagree? We drink to get drunk. We get dr we drink to have that effect. It's certainly not because whiskey tastes good. Gin doesn't taste good to me. It tastes like lighter fluid. No, it's not good. There's a lot of drink. Beer is not all that great. I drank a g gallons and gallons and gallons of it, but it doesn't taste good. I drank it because it gave me an effect. It had an effect on me. We drink to get drunk. So it goes on. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems on the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others take with impunity. So this is the dilemma of the alcoholic. The alcoholic goes out to have a couple of drinks because he needs to feel that ease and comfort. And other people are in the bar drinking and feeling that ease and comfort. But when they get up and go home, he can't. He's got to have another drink and another drink and another drink. And then he can't tell the truth from the false. You know, is this good for me? Is this what I came here for, to have a couple of drinks and feel good? Or am I starting to feel really drunk and out of my head and doing stupid stuff, which is always the result when we drink too much? So we couldn't tell the difference. We thought that being an alcoholic and being drunk like that was the only normal life. And the fact is, we believe that. If you say, what do you normally do to a, an, an alcoholic, an active alcoholic? He says, well, normally I drink. I go to the bar every day. So that's normal to an alcoholic to go and drink every day in a bar. But that's not normal. That's abnormal. Only 10% of the people or less than 10% of the people that drink are alcoholics. Some people just drink because it, they, want, they, they want to feel good. They have that sense of ease and comfort. And that's as far as it goes. And if they have a couple of drinks and they feel nice, they feel good, they won't even finish their drink. If they've had enough, they'll get up and walk out and go home. And alcoholics go crazy. They want to drink more and more and more and more and can't stop drinking. Can't put it down. So we're the abnormal ones. They're normal. And that was one of the hardest things that I had to do when I came in was to do that flip where what I used to think was normal, being sober for me was abnormal. So the first couple of weeks I was sober, it seemed abnormal. But I had to make it be normal and had to make being drunk be abnormal. And that flip is difficult. It takes a while to perfect. And then it says that they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience that sense of ease and comfort. So we are restless, irritable, and discontented while sober, while not drinking. Those are things that we kind of attributed to being drunk, part of being drunk, being irritable, discontented, uh, and restless. But that's what happens before we drink. And we get so irritable, so restless, so discontented, that we want to solve that by having a drink. And so we have one drink, and then what happens? We have another, and another, and another, and we're drunk again. But 
all those things are emotional. When we're irritable, uh, restless, irritable, discontented, and then when we come out of drinking, we're remorseful, we're afraid, we're all kinds of messed up, all kinds of things. And they're all emotions. And it's our emotions. And I say when we do the Lord's Prayer, not actually don't get mad enough, sad enough, or glad enough to pick up another drink. And that's what happens. We have an emotional attack. We get so angry, we've got to have a drink. And it's an emotion that drives us through our willpower to a drink. It's sadness that makes us want to drink. We want to go cry in our beers. Poor me, poor me. And it's an emotion that puts us into drinking. After we've already decided we're not going to drink anymore, we've made the, the promise we're not going to drink anymore. But when something emotional happens to us, we say, you know, when you get really mad, you say, I'm so damn mad, I need a drink. And boom, your willpower is useless at that point. You're mad and you're angry and you want to get a drink. So the thing is, we're sitting in the bars drinking because we're mad or whatever. We can't control the amount that we drink and we can't control our behavior while drinking. But yet we're looking at the guys on the bar stools next to us and they're having a couple of drinks. They're not doing anything nuts. They're not acting the same way we are. So we don't realize that we are different. We are a different animal altogether. And we're going to hear that more than one time in our readings tonight. So then back on the top of page 29, it says, After they have succumbed to the desire again, because they succumb because of something emotional, to that desire again, uh, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree. So, we have a desire to drink when we're not drinking. We have that desire to drink. And if that desire gets strong enough, it'll beat our willpower. We can't stop it. And then once we have the drink, that's when all hell breaks loose. When we have that drink, that's when the acetone in our body gets in there. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, where we don't digest the alcohol right. The acetone's there. The acetone is what produces the phenomenon of craving. We don't crave a drink. We desire a drink before we have one. Once we have one, we develop phenomenon of craving. And crave so bad we can't stop drinking. We're not craving a drink when we're sober. So we, we pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. So it doesn't mean that we should focus our attention on not drinking as much as we got to focus our attention on having a psychic change. We've got to, so our psyche is our mind and a psychic change is to change our mind, change the way we think about alcohol. When we have a desire to drink, if we can think, because we've had a psychic change, if we can think and realize that, yeah, I want to drink, but if I have one, I'm going to get all messed up and we can stop drink, you know, avoid that first drink, then we're good. And that's the beginning of a psychic change. But we have to think about it ahead of time. We have to be thinking about it before the drink. We can't have a drink and say, well, that was a mistake. I won't do that anymore because we've already had a drink. We will drink more too late once we've had the drink so we have that cycle of self-destruction when it's repeated over and over again without a psychic change we just keep on when we come out of one spree we're ready to head right into another spree unless we try to make some kind of forceful appeal to ourselves but we don't but then 
you know, that keeps happening. That kept happening to me. Those spree after spree after spree going around in circles. But then the doctor says something entirely different. He says, on the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, meaning people that are not alcoholics, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. Not the quantity of alcohol, because he can't have any. It's the desire to have a drink that he can control. He cannot control his drinking, but he can control the desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. What are those rules? What's a few simple rules we could think of? Be the steps. The rules of Alcoholics Anonymous are the 12 steps, the principles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those simple rules can affect a psychic change. He goes on to say, men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. These are guys that just can't beat that desire to drink. And they want to drink more. And once they drink, then they're back into the spree. And they're dying to stop, but they can't figure out how. So the doctor says, faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Can you imagine this is a doctor who's treating somebody who has a disease, the disease of alcoholism, and he can't treat them? That must be pretty hard on a doctor. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So there's the new idea that a doctor found it hard to say back in the day, back in the 30s. Doctors really had to stay in the scientific world and not in a different world. But he says here, it takes something more than human power. That's the first mention in this, in this letter that there's something more than human power that has to be applied to a person to have the psychic change necessary to overcome drinking. That, of course, we'll find out later is a higher power. Something more than human power. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So, there are people that if they go to a psychiatrist and see the psychiatrist every week and listen to what he says and do all the stuff, they will be able to stop drinking, but not fast enough, not often enough to alleviate alcoholism. The doctors are not good at it. And we found out through the years that another alcoholic helping an alcoholic is sufficient, but not a doctor helping an alcoholic, unless the doctor is an alcoholic himself. So, many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. Um and he goes on to say, I do not hold with those who believe that alcohol is, is entirely of a problem of mental control. I have had many men who have, for example, worked a period, for a period of months on some problem or business deal, which was settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date. And then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. 
They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. And why? Because they had one drink. A couple of days before this big event, they had a drink. Seems so innocent, but not to an alcoholic. Because they had that one drink, and that started a spree that lasted until after the appointment, and the whole deal was blown. So they lost everything because they had one drink. They had it a couple of days ahead. They never looked forward. You know, they never said, well, if I have this drink today, is it going to affect me later in the week? If they had that appointment on a Tuesday and they drank on a Saturday or a Sunday, did they say, well, this is going to mess me up on Tuesday? No, they were just drinking for the day. But when they started drinking for the day, they had a spree that lasted longer and they missed the appointment. And that's happened many times. They weren't drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving because they had already had a drink. If they hadn't had that drink two days before, they might have been able to, with willpower strong enough, make it through. But they made the mistake, and that's that one moment of insanity that we'll talk about, especially when we're in step two, is that moment of insanity that you think that two days before a great and big important meeting, you can have a drink. Ah, a drink won't hurt me. I don't have that meeting till Tuesday. I can drink today. And that's insanity because they know what's happened every single solitary time they drank before. When they drank, they missed days and days of their life. But we keep on doing that. As alcoholics, we just can't resist that desire for alcohol. And then that desire sets off the craving that causes us to go on a spree. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. So when we think about that drink two days before this appointment, and then they go on a spree, and when we look around our friends that we've known for years, and we look back over the years that we've been sober, how many people know somebody who has died from drinking. Everybody. Everybody knows somebody that alcoholism killed. Do you think they knew it? They didn't know in advance. But they died from alcoholism because they would they would make the supreme sacrifice, which is dying, instead of continuing the fight against alcohol. And I know that place because when I came here 21 years ago to Florida, I came here to drink myself to death. I had already made that decision. I gave up the fight. I wasn't going to try to quit anymore. I had qu tried to quit thousands of times and it never worked. And I said, the hell with it. I'm not going to try to quit anymore. So, you know, so I came here to go on a beach and drink until I died. You know, the story is that God intervened in that, changed my mind, made me have a psychic change that I didn't know anything about and that I wasn't looking for and that I wasn't trying to have, but I had it anyway and didn't understand it and scared the hell out of me, but I didn't have that drink. I came to Fort Lauderdale and never had a drink. Who would have thought? I thought, I mean, I was coming here because this is Fort Liquordale. I came here for the drinking and never had a drink here because of divine intervention, which caused a psychic change. So I never had the desire to drink. So let's talk about the classification of some alcoholics because we're not all the same. We don't all drink the same. We don't drink the same amount. We don't drink the same stuff. We change all the time. Let's see what, what some of the classifications are. And see if you can recognize yourself in any one of these classifications. The classification of alcohol seems the most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. 
Remember, we said that it's emotions that drive us to a drink. We're too happy, glad, sad, mad, whatever. So the guy that's a psychopath who is emotionally unstable, he says, we're all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful, more emotions, and make many resolutions, but never a decision. And they continue to drink, and they drink and drink and drink. They're psychopaths. If we can pull it together and stop drinking and beat the desire to drink, or just a few rules in this program, we will get to step three and make a decision. And that decision will help us not drink. Step three is incredibly important because it's made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to a power greater than ourselves. And that's what the doctor said. A psychic change would require something bigger than human power. So step three is is truly important because that's where we make a decision. Then there's the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. Most of us have done that at least once or twice in our lives, decided that, oh my God, I can't drink anymore. That's tough. Well, I'll just try some wine. You know, or, or I'll stop drinking all that tequila and I'll go to beer. Beer's not nearly as strong. I won't get as drunk on beer as I did on tequila. Surprise, surprise, after a few six packs. <clears throat> then there is the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. That's the guy who refuses to believe that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. He refuses to believe that alcohol can go in remission, but it's still there. We can treat alcoholism, but it's still there. If we have a drink six months, nine months, a year later, we're going to go right back into the hole again. And it's been proven many, many times. There is the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. And we all know those guys. Then there are types entirely normal in every respect except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. Charlie of Joe and Charlie claims that as he's the, that kind of alcoholic because it says he's able, intelligent, and friendly. But he was actually a drunk. And everything about that drunk is exactly good, except he can't control his drinking. And alcohol affects him horribly. So all these and many more have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. They are the ones that are allergic to alcohol. If you're allergic to alcohol, you cannot drink alcohol. And it's, you know, it's, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago with the allergies of strawberries, peanuts, shellfish, you know, shellfish and peanuts, those people won't eat a lobster, they won't eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, because they know they're on the way to the hospital if they do. So they won't drink that, I eat that, okay? But other foods that you're allergic to, strawberries and milk, you'll, you'll eat a strawberry and drink, because it's not going to kill you. It's going to make you very uncomfortable for a few days. But it's not going to kill you. So people do it. And we alcoholics will drink the alcohol. But what happens when we do? If we drink enough, we will die. If we don't get it under control, we'll die from it. It's poison to us. The book says so. It is poison to us because we're allergic to it. So if we drink, we can die. And it tells us that over and over again. And we all know somebody who died from it. It's not, But yet, 
even though we know somebody that died from drinking alcohol, we think it can't happen to us. Well, they thought it couldn't happen to them. Who are we fooling? We're fooling ourselves. We can't fool ourselves in this drinking. This phenomenon that we have suggested may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. We are not like anybody else. We are a different entity. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. No matter what treatment you get, you are still an alcoholic. Nothing fixes that. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. 100% never have another drink. Do not consume alcohol. That's the only thing you can survive from. And that's the only way to keep your disease in remission. And in order to get there, you have to have a psychic change, a complete change of the mind and the way we think. And in order to get that mind changed, we need help from a power greater than ourselves. We're just not capable of doing it ourselves. Many, many people, all of us have tried it over and over again, trying to quit, trying to stop drinking, trying to stay sober doing everything we can think of, and we can't do it until we have help from a power greater than ourselves. And that's just the rule. That's it. That's how it happens. And it says, this immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed if they don't have a psychic change, if they don't accept a power greater than themselves, if they don't follow a few simple rules that can be laid out for them, simple as can be. But alcoholics are stubborn. They'll argue the fact that taking poison is okay for them. When they know it's poison, when you can show them all the information that says that this many people die from alcohol, alcoholism, this many people have bad livers, this many people have pancreatitis, this many people have heart attacks. You know, you can show them all the information. All these people get so drunk, they drive and drive into a pole. Or they're so drunk, they fall into the water and drown themselves. All sorts of things. Alcohol kills you by different methods. And we see that happen all the time, and yet we say, yeah, but I could still have a drink. You know, that won't happen to me. So it's important that we get honest with ourselves, so look at our innermost selves, get honest with ourselves, and say, damn it, I'm an alcoholic. I cannot drink. If I drink, I will die. And we have to come to believe that, and we have to do whatever it takes Follow a few simple rules. Get a sponsor. Go to meetings. Read the big book. A few little things that we do for fun any other time. But in the beginning, we don't want to do any of those things. But yet, they're so easy to do. And that's a solution. And that's a solution that will help us live. I think I'll stop there. Give us some time to talk. See what you thought. See if you remember those times that you got nuts and crazy. Um, and um, we'll finish up this next week talking about the solution. We'll, we'll have an in-depth talk about the solution before we stop, start Bill's story. So, Alan, back to you. Thank you all very much.